So it's now three o'clock. <coughs> so we can start a continuation from the last Sutta class which I gave, which was on the Satipatthana. So here we go. Namo tasa bhagavato alahato samma sambuddhasa Namo tasa bhagavato alahato samma sambuddhasa Namo tasa bhagavato alahato samma sambuddhasa Bhutang Dhammang Sankang Namasami. So the last time, two weeks ago, uh, we got as far as just the four postures. We started the Satipatthana uh, Samyutta, otherwise known as the Right Mindfulness, with um, each one of these practices, they always begin with having restrained the five hindrances, you abide aware of the body, energized, knowing the purpose of what you are doing, and mindful. And that's only repeated at the very beginning, but applies to every one of these uh, practices. We did that with the mindfulness of breathing. We do it again, having restrained the five hindrances, uh, abide aware of the body in these particular forms and then energize knowing the purpose of what you're doing, which is important. Why are you doing that? What's the purpose? What's the goal of it? And having uh, discussed that in depth with the first of the practices, which was mindfulness of the body, then we got to the four postures. When walking, you are aware in the present that I am walking. When standing, sitting or lying down, you are aware in the present that I am lying down. Thus you maintain present moment awareness of however your body is disposed. In this way you are aware of your own body or you are aware that the bodies of others of the same nature as yours or you abide aware of both your own and others' bodies or else you abide aware of what causes the arising of this thing we call body, which is again the four nutriments. I did mention those last time, but I'll mention them again because in each one of these uh, mindfulness of the body, this is the, the instructions. Where did this body come from? What causes it? What sustains it? And of course the answer is it comes from the uh, food, gross food, uh, from sensory contact, uh, from will, and from consciousness. And I always thought that was a wonderful thing to know because this is how you are aware of what keeps this body going. And again, whenever you see someone in a vegetative condition, if they're in a hospital bed, please Make sure that uh, they're fed. Make sure that you, know, you touch them, have sensory contact. The will is up to them. And the same as the consciousness. But what we can do to keep people alive, if that's what you think you should be doing, is always to maintain that, con that contact with them. Even if they don't respond, touch them, talk to them. Uh, play music, which is especially uh, good, not just music which they're not aware of or which they're not used to, and the old music which they grew up with. Anyway, you abide aware of what causes the arising of a body, or you abide aware the body will cease when the four nutriments cease, or you abide contemplating the body's cause or nature of both arising and ceasing. Why do you do that? Because once you know the things have causes and then they arise, they maintain for a while and then when those causes disappear, so does the thing itself. This is the whole purpose of doing this Satipatthana. You see these things aren't substantial. The greatest simile was the, in the Agi Vachagota Sutta where I adapt this 
make it easier to understand, but the simile is pretty much the same, that a candle flame depends, is caused by three things, the heat, the wax, and the wick. And if any one of those three things is used up, stops, ceases, then the flame ceases. The, the wax is all used up, the wick is all exhausted, or the heat is blown away by a wind, then the candle flame goes out. It literally, as I said in those days, it nibbanas. And this is actually the idea that even the body, the body is only as we know it, the body with life in it is only there because of four things. The food, the sensory contact, the will and the consciousness. When those, one of those four things disappears, then the body ceases. It's not a permanent entity. Or else mindful, mindfulness that it is just a body. And this particular phrase here also indicates that the meaning of mindfulness is not just awareness, it's awareness keeping things in mind. In other words, with like a memory, looking at them in an accurate, correct way. So you're mindful, it's just a body, that's all. Impermanent, suffering, and not me, not mine, not a permanent essence. And of course, I love those things. We know it's impermanent, it's unreliable, but to realize it is suffering, yeah, a lot of people we try and get rid of that suffering. When you're young, you don't have so much suffering. When you get to my age or those older than me, you know it's more unreliable and more suffering. And also that it's uh, not mine, not me, not mine. It means I cannot order my body around. It'd be great if I could tell my body, do this and do that but it won't, it won't respond, it's beyond its means. I don't own it, I'm stuck with it. And not me, not mine, not a permanent essence. Is established in you to the extent necessary for mindfulness and wisdom, essential for liberation. If ever we feel that our body or parts of our body uh, is under our control, it can last forever then there's no way we can find liberation from this world. And it is kind of amazing that sometimes people feel that if they could uh, tweak the way this body works, uh, they could live forever. And I know that I repeat myself because I give so many talks and many of those talks are on YouTube and you've seen and heard so many of my talks but I still remember when I was young, there was one movie called Dracula, <laughs> but it was always called The Thinking Man's Dracula. In other words, it wasn't just a horror flick, it was, had some meaning behind it. And the main meaning was the inner conflict of this being who could live forever as long as it never went out into the, the direct sunlight and so would live in caves and go out at night time. The conflict inside of him was that he'd been there, done everything, there was nothing more to do in this world. He was kind of bored, but in a very deep level. And the conflict was, he had a choice of still living in the suffering of eternity or basically committing suicide and eventually that he allowed himself to be lured out during the daytime so he could die. He realized that this body was suffering, no matter how fit and healthy it was. Basically, being there, done that, what is there to stimulate him? So anyway, I always remember that movie as something which was quite deep. And so if you still feel this body is forever, or you want it to be forever, then there is no Mindfulness of wisdom is essential for liberation. That's the other, another way that you are mindful of the body. So this is way number two. You know, some of the talks which I have given always compared this body 
uh, and you inside of it is like being in a prison with five high walls. And those five high walls are your five senses, which basically define your body. You know, the seeing, hearing, smelling, taste and touch. And when those five senses are there, it's like you're in a prison. You can make this prison quite uh, peaceful, quite pleasant. And that's why I adapted that simile many times. That, you know, you've been born in that prison as the five senses, and then you meet another nice little person in, the f in that prison of the five senses, you get married, you have a few other prisoners as, as you know, your children. And if you're very lucky, you work very hard, you can move into some very, very nice uh, multiple cells in the prison with nice views and you can have lots and lots of lovely things around you and it can feel so comfortable, but you're still in the prison. And then one day you find a little tunnel which has been dug by this person called the Buddha. And you can go into that tunnel and when you go into that tunnel you can escape from the five senses. It's a hard thing to escape from those five senses because in your prison you've got a, a prison officer He's called Will, and Will will never allow you to be still enough to go into that tunnel and the Eightfold Path and escape, first of all, from the five senses and go into the realm of the mind beyond those prison walls, which is fantastic, but then even go beyond that. So that is some simile for the purpose of what we're doing this for. And I'll just go a little bit uh, further the next um, way of practice under the body contemplation, again still having um, restrained the five hindrances that has to be done first in each one of these, abide aware of the body, energized, knowing the purpose of what you are doing and mindful and then you go to the full comprehension of the purpose, why you are doing these things. You act in full comprehension of the purpose. That's the Sampajanya. For those people who are Thai, I always remember Ajahn Chah would or never just uh, talk about mindfulness, sati, would always call it satipanya, mindfulness with wisdom. And that's exactly the same meaning as sati sampajanya. And this is the sampajanya part of mindfulness. You act in full comprehension of the purpose when going forward and returning. Why are you walking? Why are you coming back? What's the purpose of that? Because sometimes people walk around aimlessly. Even if it's for exercise, great! There's a meaning behind what you are doing. You act in full comprehension of the purpose when looking ahead and looking away. Why are you using your eyes? Because otherwise people can just go looking all over the place just for stimulation, and that's not a very good purpose if you wish to practice mindfulness. When flexing and extending your limbs, when wearing your clothes and carrying things, you act in full comprehension of the purpose when uh, regarding eating, drinking, defecating and urinating, walking, standing, sitting, sleeping, being awake, talking and keeping silent. And I'm going to point out uh, one uh, unusual translation. It's absolutely accurate, sleeping. Because if you ever look at some of the early translations of the Buddha's words, you will see instead of saying sleeping there, they say falling asleep. But the Pali words do not mean that. What happened here is people misunderstood what the mindfulness practice is and they quite logically said, well how can you be aware when you are sleeping? Because the sleep is like the opposite of awareness. So they tweaked the Pali and they gave the word a meaning it doesn't have saying falling asleep. There's another word used for falling asleep. The word in the Pali does mean in sleep. So how can we be mindful while we are in sleep? Of course you can't be. 
But what you do is you're mindful before you go to sleep. What are you sleeping for? This is a comprehension of the purpose. The purpose is what you understand before you enact that activity. What's the purpose of being awake? And the next one is great. What's the purpose of talking? It'd be wonderful if people were mindful of why they are talking. And if they were, I'm sure they would talk so much less. Please don't look at me, who probably talks more than any of you, but I have a purpose for this. My purpose is to instruct you. I'm a teacher, I've got to do that. And the purpose of keeping silent, which is a beautiful way of understanding the benefits of silence. You know that sometimes you can listen to somebody and even <laughs> Venerable Sadhavi Hari was talking to me today that sometimes, I shouldn't say this but here we go, <laughs> sometimes that when someone asks you to do something, they give you some instruction, say, Prem, you know, would you mind doing this or doing that? And what you do, you say, okay. The answer okay is a beautiful answer because it doesn't say yes, it doesn't say no, but it serves the purpose of shutting the other person up. They think you've listened, you just, you just say okay, and then you can go on and do whatever business you're doing. So that's a wonderful skill for me. I shouldn't say that, you're going to get in trouble with, with your people you live with. And they ask you, did you put the cat out? And say, okay. Mm -hmm. You haven't done a thing, but <laughs> it's kind of acceptable. <laughs> anyway, the, the purpose behind all of these things and keeping silent. In this way, you are aware of your own body, how your body is. You're aware that the bodies of others are the same nature as yours. You're not special, you're not different. Everybody is pretty much the same quality. Uh, or else you abide aware of both your own and others' bodies. This uh, phrase is in all of the uh, parts of the of right mindfulness, just to make sure that people never feel that somehow that they're different than others, that they're special, they're higher, or that they're lower. And that's actually one of the great realizations which happens. And it was the, one of the main realizations. Uh, uh, very often, when people would come to the Buddha and inform him that they had broken through the final stage, that they were fully enlightened arahats, they were called, they would never say, I am now an arahat. No one would ever say that. What they would say was that one who is fully enlightened never claims to be better, worse, or the same as anybody else. That whole judgment thing has disappeared from them. They just, they're not there. So they can't say they're better, they can't say they're worse, they can't even say they're the same. They're none of those. So you can see here, it's not about being better than anybody else, just everybody, you know, if they're not enlightened, you may be able to to judge or this person, that person, whatever, but really, there's no one there. So you're by aware of what causes the arising of the body, the four nutriments, so you're by aware the body will cease when the four nutriments cease. In other words, it's not yours, it's not dependable, it's going to one day disappear totally. Or you're by contemplating the body's causal nature, both arising and ceasing. You know, that's sometimes one of the reasons why that people who can recall their previous lives. And if you recall your previous lives through deep meditation, it's always the case that you have no uh, hindrances at that time. So no doubt, and you know for sure that that was you. And that gives you this great data, information. You've been in other bodies before, not the one you have now, but maybe different gender different race, different all sorts of stuff. And that what shows you very clearly this body you're in now is certainly not you. You're not defined by the body, you're limited by the body. 
but not defined by it. Or else mindful, mindfulness is just a body. Impermanent suffering and not me, not mine, not a permanent essence is established in you to the extent necessary for mindfulness and wisdom, essential for liberation. And you abide independent, not clinging to anything in this world. This is another way that you are mindful of the body. Or we get the bodily parts, another way of looking at the body, looking at bit by bit. Now we used to chant this and when we chanted this you know, in monasteries, we used to chant the 30, what was it, how many? Oh, you know my tricks, don't you? Everybody calls it 32 parts of the body. But actually, if you count the ones which the Buddha listed, it's only 31 parts of the body. I was waiting for one of you to say 32 so I could say no. <laughs> and the 32nd part of the body was added later. And that was actually the brain. I think that's one of the reasons why Buddhism was such a wise religion, because it didn't have the brain. <laughs> but it added it afterwards. Anyway, it doesn't really matter, because if any of you have done anatomy at a university or whatever, a medical school, you can split the body up into so many different parts. The 31 parts or 32 parts, that's just one way. So you view your body from head to toe, bounded by skin, as made up of many kinds of parts, blood and bones, tissues and organs, just as though we're a full shopping bag with many kind of groceries, such as bread, potatoes, fruit and vegetables. So too you view the same body as full of many parts thus. In this body there are hair, there are hairs, bones, <laughs> feces, <laughs> <laughs> and well, you're right. I put that one in there because sometimes that's how people call it you know, in real life, but sometimes as a monk, sometimes I'm not allowed to say such things, or people think I'm not allowed to, and sometimes I rebel against that. As I speak, so you speak. And that's something which the Buddha actually said. He said that when you give a Dhamma talk, you should teach in the local language. The words you use, if I'm a good Buddhist and follow the great Buddha, the teacher, I have to use the words which you use. At least most of you use anyway. That is another way that you are mindful of the body. Now you may also notice there that I never mentioned 31 or 32 parts. I never listed the parts. Because you can list the parts in so many different ways. So instead I put, review the body from head to toe, bounded by skin, it's made up of many kinds of parts, blood and bones, tissues and organs. And instead of saying the different types of rice, which is of course what they would say there was in some sort of shopping bag, I made it more Western. There were a full shopping bag with many kinds of groceries, such as bread, potatoes, fruit and vegetables. So you can see in this translation which I've done here, that you've kept the meaning, but made it more accessible for people. So we don't say different types of rice, red rice, hill rice or whatever. You make it just as you would have a shopping bag. And sometimes the reason why we do that, again, with all this way, it's just dot, 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 that is another way you're mindful of the body. You review that body as your body, your body is made of those parts, my body is made of the parts, all bodies are the same that way. It's just a body that's all. It's made up of stuff. And then also that you realize that it's not me, not mine, not a self. It's just a body made up of parts. And I don't know that, I think maybe these days, maybe because of the education we have at uh, schools, that you are permitted, you know, to actually to see parts of bodies. I certainly remember just going to 
even medical museums uh, over in Thailand where they had the different parts of the bodies just in jars. And of course that was very helpful to understand actually what a body is. So you can never look at a body and say oh, that's very beautiful. Somebody sent me a, uh, an article about, because I mentioned in one of my talks that you know, one of these so-called beautiful film actresses, Sarah Jessica Parker, who was photographed reading my book, Opening the Door of Your Heart, in a coffee shop somewhere in New York. And then apparently, now she, that was many years ago, she's much older now, and they sent a photograph of her now. And it really is an old lady now. Is she? Was she a young lady? Was that you, uh, uh, Cherry, who sent me that? No, okay. I forget who actually said to me, but it was useful. You could see a person who was supposed to be a highly attractive film actress many years ago. But today, you know, she, she would, if she came in here today, you would look at her and just, just an old woman. Which, which is the right, the real Sarah Jessica Parker? It's nice to be able to see that the body which you look at and you identify with, is that really who you are? And why is it the face which is so important? Why is it when you go to airports, they take a picture of your face and compare it to their records to find out if that really is you? Why a face? Why not your toes? Well, I'm sure that if you're an expert on toes, everybody's toes would be unique. But anyway, the face, and also, I remember just reading in an article that there were so many like wealthy women were going over to um, South Korea, to Seoul, to get face um, transplants or something, uh, cosmetic surgery. And they had a great difficulty. They could get into the country, they had all their visas, but when they went out of the country, they could not be recognized. And they were in big trouble, you know, you don't exist, who are you? Are you some sort of migrant or spy or something? <laughs> not that any of you would go to facial surgery to South Korea, but if you did, then be careful. Or, you review your body by way of elements, thus. In this body there is the earth element, water element, fire element and air element. It's just looking at the body in a different way. That's all it is. Another way you're mindful of the body. Or, oh, we now get to the nine charnel ground contemplations. And you've got to be careful with this one because sometimes people read this and think they have to do this and sometimes it's very hard to find bodies decomposing in nature, certain so, uh, human bodies, because we are, we're not accepting of the decay of a human body. So sometimes, I know in the forest, some people have used like kangaroo bodies. You know, kangaroos who have either got hit by a car, or kangaroos who have, especially the male kangaroos, had a fight and most of the fights between the male kangaroos are fights to the death. There's only a certain amount of females and the males you know, have to be dominant. So they fight with each other and this one usually just has to die. And anyway, that sometimes the monks you know, know where that corpse is and they just go every day to have a look to see how it just decays. You have to be careful there because sometimes if you don't get the uh, the natural sort of decaying body, they get photographs of it. And I told them, look, there's a lot of people, if you had a photograph book like that and somebody saw you, they think you're really weird and you know, gross photographs. But nevertheless, it does show you just what the nature of this human body is. It can be strong and healthy and handsome or beautiful, but then after a while it just fades away. And this is how, in those days, 
when uh, many of those bodies were thrown into the charnel grounds and left to rot. You see a corpse thrown aside in the charnel ground up to three days old, bloated, livid, oozing matter. You reflect that your own body is of the same nature. It may be become like that. It's not exempt from that fate. Or you see a corpse thrown aside in the charnel ground being devoured by birds, animals or maggots. You reflect that your own body is of the same nature. It may become like that. It is not exempt from that fate. Or you see a corpse thrown aside in a charnel ground, a skeleton with flesh and blood held together with sinews, a fleshless skeleton smeared with blood, a skeleton without flesh and blood, blood held together with sinews, disconnected bones scattered in all directions, bones bleached white, the color of shells, bones heaped up, bones more than a year old, rotted and crumbled to dust. Then you reflect your own body is of the same nature, it may become like that, it's not exempt from that fate. So what's the purpose of that? Remember in each one of these, we are mindful, aware that our body, other people's body of the same nature, and that we do this to realize that this body is not me, not mine, not a self. This is its real nature. So you make the best use of it when it's um, healthy and fit and able to do stuff. In this way you are aware of your own body or you are aware of the bodies of others of the same nature as yours. Or you abide aware of both your own and others' bodies. Or else you abide aware of what causes the arising of the body, the four nutriments. Or you abide aware that the body is of the nature to cease when the four nutriments cease. Or you abide contemplating the body's causal nature of both arising and ceasing. Or else a mindfulness that is just a body, impermanent, suffering, and not me, not mine, and not a permanent essence, is established in you to the extent necessary for mindfulness and wisdom, essential for liberation. And you abide independent, not clinging to anything in the world. That is another way that you are mindful of the body. And interestingly, in uh, this particular sutta, they have the benefits, and actually it's in the, another sutta close by, the benefits of mindfulness of the body. If you practice mindfulness of the body, what happens? You overcome delight and discontent. You know, sometimes many of our things we delight in are like bodily things, and discontent, a lot of it is a bodily discontent. If somebody calls you stupid, somebody calls you fat, somebody calls you ugly. Or you see your own body getting fat, getting ugly. I don't know about you, but I know that I never knew the day when I woke up and I looked myself in the mirror and thought I was fat. It didn't happen overnight, it happens incrementally. That one day you're old, you look in the mirror, you're old. Where did that come from? This is a problem, that these things creep up on you. And anyway, you overcome that, that's part of having a body, that's its nature. You overcome fear and dread. What are you afraid of? A lot of times people are afraid of, not, I'm not talking about the pain of the body now, we're talking about the uh, destruction of the body or the dismembering of the body, the hurting of the body. This is the fear and dread about the body about to disappear and die. I mean, how old are you now here? I'm now 72. Who here is older than 72? You. So you're ahead of me on the, the path to death. <laughs> I know that many, well, I shouldn't say that, I've already started. I said this at lunchtime to the Thai people. I always said, that, you know, 72 as a month, you know, that's almost, that should be old enough to retire. But then my argument totally fell apart when somebody told me that a couple of days ago it was the birthday of Bhante Gunaratana over in the uh, United States on the, west, on the East Coast. He's now 96, and he's still out there teaching 
and giving amazing talks and he's 96. <laughs> That's really unfair. <laughs> but, Quite likely, yes. But it's not my attitude, <laughs> it's your <laughs> attitude. <laughs> no, yeah, of course I did say that. But then just seeing just how old he was, that's it. And he's still very active and, and teaches so much, he really gives himself an amazing monk. But he's only one. Yeah, he's not teaching so much these days, honestly. Every week. Are you sure it's not the same talk? Well, it's actually my, that's, I'm the same already, the same jokes. <laughs> okay, yeah, okay. Oh my goodness. <laughs> okay, so anyway, I'll be here in a couple of weeks time when I get back from Penang. So, no, <laughs> no hope for me. You're still here, hopefully some new jokes next time. Anyway, <laughs> you overcome the fear and dread when you realize it's just a body. You bear cold and heat, hunger and thirst. I know the cold and heat certainly because I recently came in from London and it was six degrees there. When I landed in Perth, it was 40. <laughs> That's a lot to bear, 34 degrees different for me in one day, a day and a half. Hunger and thirst. Hunger's not a problem. Thirst is amazing. That just maybe because I was in time with Ajahn Chah, sometimes he'd make you sit in meditation for hours, and you didn't have any water, but you you've survived. And you lost that fear of you know, being thirsty, lost that fear of heat or not having much in your tummy. And contact with flies, mosquito, ticks, wind and sun, and creeping things. How you bear that? Of course, I think you know that story about mosquitoes. That was very hard in those early years because I was born in London. They don't have mosquitoes in London. And so when you were stuck in the forests and there were so many mosquitoes around and there was no mosquito repellent, there was no uh, Nothing, no mosquito, there was mosquito nets, we weren't allowed to use them when we were meditating. And no mosquito screens, and that was very tough. But one thing which I did learn about mosquitoes, and flies as well, if you don't worry about them, if you are calm and peaceful, then your metabolism reduces, goes down. Which means you don't emit so much carbon dioxide from your pores which means the mosquitoes, they can't find you. And that was kind of incredible. If you thought about them, worried about them, they'd swarm all over you, many at a time, 60 or 70 at a time. But when you just went very peaceful and quiet, I mean, in your mind, you did your meditation properly, then you come out of your meditation, you couldn't see any mosquito bites on your arms or on your head or anywhere. And. I thought it was something magical about meditation, about stillness, the samadhi. But it was just the effect of lowering your metabolism. That the flies and mosquitoes, you could bear them because they couldn't find you. You endure unwelcome words and arisen bodily feelings that are painful and menacing to life. And a lot of time I think that's true what you said, I said that it's reactions to the, the attitudes to these pains that has a huge amount to, deal, to, uh, to say about how you survive or you don't survive them. It's something I'm sure there's many uh, GPs here, doctors. But anyway, one GP which uh, I had, we came to visit us when we were uh, just learning how to teach kids in a school. And he always told me, he said, it's maybe not a good thing to repeat here, but this is what he said that if any of the kids in your class have some sort of accident, they spill acid all over them, or they cut themselves, or you know, there's a big accident there, always lie, he said. Look at their wound, and if you think you're gonna faint, 
just tell them, no, it's, that's okay, that's not a, a serious wound. Because he was saying that the reaction to a wound or some sort of a physical um, problem, you know, such as acid on you in the chemistry lab, it, it's the reaction which causes the panic, the fear, and it's the fear which usually kills a person. Reassuring them, saying, you're going to be fine, you're going to be okay was actually, often he said, would save their life. Anyway, I'm not quite sure if I could do that. Just the honesty is just a bit too important for me. Anyway, so you overcome fear and dread. You bear cold, heat, hunger, thirst, contact with flies, mosquitoes, ticks, wind, the sun, creeping things. You endure unwelcome words and arisen bodily feelings that are painful and menacing to life or you experience whenever needed, without difficulty, the four jhanas that constitute the higher mind, the adi jitta, and provide a pleasant abiding in this very life. You've heard me talk about jhanas so often, and this is a lovely thing to say, that when you practice the mindfulness of the body deeply, one of the results is it's much easier to enter the jhanas. Why? Very, very easy to say, but the reason is that you're not so attached, involved with the five senses and the body which it represents. You can let them go much more easily. You know, you've seen through them, it's just a body, that's all. Not me, not mine, not a self. It's just the body. So it makes it easy for you to not be so concerned about it, to put it down, to let it go. And the result of letting it go is experiences for jhanas. Or oh, you wield the various kinds of supernormal power. You know sometimes people say, I just look around me, the people who come here today, let's be honest, you know, how many of you are under 30? Under 40? That's called middle age. We're the young people. So sometimes if you start talking about you can wield the various kinds of power. Having been one, you can become many. Because after Harry Potter, many of the kids are really interested in those powers. They probably will never get them, but at least it's a an advertising uh, opportunity to get kids. Is that going to be true? <laughs> Maybe not, <laughs> but anyhow. This is what would happen. The supernormal powers having become one, you become many, have become many, you become one. You appear and vanish. You go unhindered through a wall or through a mountain as though through space. You dive in and out of the earth as though it were water, you walk on water without sinking, as though it were earth, sitting cross-legged, you can travel in space like a bird, you wield bodily mastery even as far as the Brahma world. Or with clear audience, you hear sounds both heavenly and human, those that are far as well as near. You can read the minds of other persons, having encompassed them with your own mind especially whether the mind is affected by one of the five hindrances or whether it's experienced jhana. You can recollect your past lives, even up to a hundred thousand births, and many eons of expanding universes, many eons of decaying universes. Is There was, when I first read this, it kind of moved me, not because of all these claims, but just the, uh, what they were talking about, not just one rebirth, but eons of existence. And as a theoretical physics, physicist, that kind of blew my mind. The fact that they're not just talking about one or two lives, but whole eons of existence. Big bangs to big whimpers or crunches, however the universe would end. And the whole time scale, it just expanded. You know, what I could contemplate, not just one life, but thousands of lives in many sorts of different forms. 
It just, the stretch, and you know, the big picture became enormously big. There I was so named of such a family with such an appearance, such was my food, such my experience of pleasure and pain, such my lifetime, and passing away from there I reappeared in this other place. And there too I was so named of such a family, such my life term, and passing away from there I reappeared here. Thus with their aspects and particulars you recollect many of your past lives. And with clairvoyance you see beings passing away and reappearing, inferior and superior, fear, fair and ugly, fortunate and unfortunate, and one understands how beings are reborn according to their actions, karma. And by realizing for yourself with direct experience in this very life, you enter upon and abide in the deliverance of mind and deliverance of wisdom. You're an enlightened one. Those last three, recollecting your past lives and uh, understanding the law of karma according to your own experience of rebirth, and by realizing for yourself the uh, deliverance of mind and wisdom, you're an enlightened one. They are called you know, the, the Tewija, the three insights. And that's actually how the Buddha became enlightened, through those three insights. So it's not just mindfulness of the body, the mindfulness of the body leads to it being very easy to uh, experience jhanas and then get the rest of these great insights. So, I'll pause for questions, comments, or complaints. The three C's. Actually, one is a Q. <laughs> Goodness. Are you all bamboozled? Oh, you're going in there. If not, you can carry on a bit longer. Yes. Yeah. Hello? Yes. With regards to being aware of um, your own body and the body of others, um, because you're aware of the body of ours with your senses, so you can't really be aware of the body yeah, of what? others. You can be aware of the sensory input that yeah. represents the bodies of others. It is the insight you get from the awareness you have of others that they are the same as you. That they are in their um, usual characteristics no different from you. Yeah. So it doesn't matter who they happen to be, what diseases they may have, what limitations they have, just you know, their health, their fame, their misfortune, whatever it is they have, you see that they're in essence the same as you. Yes, so similar. But the, that which you are aware of is the, uh, that which the, your senses tell you about yes. the outside. So, well, are you really aware of the bodies of others when you really are aware of the uh, sensory input that represents the bodies of others? Yes, that's what gives you the data. Yeah. And from that data, that's where you get the insight. The mm. seeing that everything is leading you to see with a great deal of clarity that they may look different, may be taller, they may be different gender, uh, but they're basically the same characteristics. That even them, they're not a self, they don't own their body, that uh, the body is of a causal nature, it will disappear. You make the 
call the insights based on that um, seeing, that hearing, that smelling, tasting, touching. From that experience you develop the insights of a similarity, especially never believing or never uh, getting any ed evidence to actually to say this is like a, a supreme being or this is an eternal being or this is something which is so different than every, anybody else. To see the similarities. So you gain the evidence, the data from your sensory experience. Mm. But then you use your uh, mental abilities to see the commonalities. Mm. Interesting, thank you. Okay. Another question? There's a few questions here. Maybe I'll do one or two, and then we'll see. Dear Ajahn Brahm, well, this is, you have helped m move more people move towards peace and enlightenment than you can ever imagine. That's true. I can't imagine that at all. <laughs> but anyway, I am thousands of miles away where Buddhism doesn't exist, but I found you. I'm so grateful. Thank you. Gloria, sometimes when I learn the sutra, I feel like I'm not able to connect it to my meditation. How to connect the two? I've already been talking about how to connect those two. You see the nature of your body. You know, when I do meditation and I give guided meditation, I start with body meditation. You know, just knowing my body and just knowing how to relax it, knowing how to make it peaceful. And then when the body is peaceful, then it's so easy to let it go. And once it's let go, then these other things can happen. And it's also, I know if a body is sick or injured or something, you just realize that these are just uh, the nature of the body to be sick and you, it's the same as every other body. And so that means, I know it's just this body, it's just doing what the body does. And so you don't have any fear or any sort of, uh, uh, any problem with sickness or with old age or even with death. So if you keep focusing on the sutta and you also do your meditation, the two together will strengthen the insights which are said here. And what is this body anyway? It's just this phenomena which is caused by food and by uh, sensory contact, by will and by consciousness. I'll do another question and I'll just carry on arising and passing away, which I thought was a very interesting passage which is coming next. Dear Ajahn, what makes psychic powers possible? Is it because everything is mind-made? Perhaps because there is nothing in the center of everything? Is mind-reading possible from a distance? Thank you. It's again very rare to actually to witness things like psychic powers. Now mind-reading is probably the most common of those psychic powers which you see. And I can be honest with you, that, that was one of the first things which I saw from an Ajahn Chah. I've told the story before, but it was something which you know, made me realize that this fellow had some amazing meditation. When I first went up to Wat Ba Pong, a newly ordained monk, and just uh, we were doing some chores in the monastery and Ajahn Chah came along and just gave me some praise. You know, the flattery, and that flattery never made much of a difference to me. And he said I was making some nice baskets. And I looked at my basket and I said, you know, that's almost like lying. My basket was terrible looking. It was like a flattery. But then uh, there was another monk who was you know, about the same, he was like a novice at the time, and he was asking some questions of Ajahn Chah. And as he was asking some questions, you know, through a translator, I was just overhearing, see what Ajahn Chah would answer. And his answers were nothing to do with the question which this novice asked. 
but it had everything to do with what I was thinking. And it was weird. And then I deliberately thought another question. And this novice asked a question, totally different. It was translated into Thai, Ajahn Chah answered, and the translation came out as a very good answer to my question. I did this for four or five times. And every time I thought a question, that was a question which Ajahn Chah answered. And at the end, just to confirm, I asked this American novice, so what do you think of those answers? And he said, they were crazy and they made no sense to me. And I knew why, because it was my questions I was thinking, and Ajahn Chah was answering. And that was kind of weird. It certainly convinced me that that monk had powers to read your mind. But be careful, if anybody, any of you, manages to actually to experience such things, I would not encourage it. The reason is, if you're not in a position of being a teacher, reading somebody else's mind, I always consider to be an invasion of privacy. It's a kind of immoral. If you give me permission, fine, or give someone permission, fine. But a lot of time, it's a wrong thing to do. And the other thing is many other times of psychic powers. I think I'm, I mentioned somewhere recently, there was an Indonesian monk who I knew, uh, who had a very strong mind, developed powers. And one of the things he did one day, this was in Wat Bawan in Bangkok, he had a meditation class once a week, and one of my friends, I knew very well, that she went to that class, and in the middle of the meditation class, she opened her eyes because you know, she thought that something weird was happening, like you know, the electricity in the air sort of thing. And when she opened her eyes, she saw rays of light coming out of the eyes of this monk into one of the other meditators like laser eyes and a real light coming out. She freaked out. She got up and left and never went back again. And I mention that story because a lot of times like psychic powers just scare you. And people say, oh no, I won't be scared. <laughs> yeah, you do get scared. So that's one of the reasons why it's very rare to actually to show such things. And why does it happen? That's, I think, is again, because the primacy of the mind. Things are mind-made, and the mind is the, the most important part of this world. And it's not so developed, nowhere near enough. Okay, I'm going to go back to the sutta now. Just the arising and passing away, the rise and fall. Is that paragraph up there? Oh, good. And the reason which I mention this is because, again, when it was first pointed out to me that you have like this Satipatthana Samyutta, which is basically the majority of this right, view, right um, mindfulness. But there's also a whole Samyutta um, chapter on Satipatthana. And there you got some amazing sort of little insights into how to read that Satipatthana Sutta. And this is uh, the Satipatthana Sutta, Satipatthana Samyutta, sorry, Sutta number 42. When it says in each one of these Samyuttas that you, so each one of these um, uh, Satipatthanas, you abide aware of what causes the arising of the body or this Vedana experience or citta, or conscious, or um, mind objects. You abide aware of what causes the arising, of, abide aware of what causes the ceasing, of, abide what causes the arising and the ceasing. And sometimes the people interpret that as you know, just seeing things rise and fall. And that's not what the Buddha meant. This is how the Buddha described it in the uh, Samyutta, Satipatthana Samyutta Sutta 42. 
I will teach you the origination and the passing away of the four focuses of mindfulness. This is where they say, know the rising and the falling. It's not quite rise and fall. Number one, supported by the four nutriments, there is the origination and continuance of the, of the body. With the cessation of the four nutriments, the body ceases. The four nutriments are food, six sense contacts, will, and consciousness, is. Not just one consciousness, but the consciousnesses. That's what it means when they say rise and fall of the body. Why it rises, why it continues, why it disappears, why it ceases. Not just seeing it happening, but understand why. Supported by the six contacts, six, sorry, the six sense contacts, there is the origination of experience, you know, the Vedana. With the cessation of the six sense contacts, experience ceases. So seeing Vedana come and go, that's not what the Buddha meant. It's understanding why you need the six sense contacts to have Vedana. And when the six, six sense contacts stop, Vedana stops. And the next one is very powerful and for some monks, controversial. But this is what the Buddha actually said. You can check it out for yourself in the Satipatthana Samyutta 42. Supported by Nama Rupa, what I often call the objects of consciousness. That's an abbreviation. If you want to find out Nama Rupa, the whole lot of Nama Rupa, you can find that out. But Nama Rupa is a thing. With the supported by Nama Rupa, there is the origination of the citta. This is like the mind, the mind consciousness. It doesn't exist by itself. With the cessation of Nama Rupa, the citta ceases. This mind is not a permanent uh, essence. It's not always there. It comes and goes, it's supported by this thing we call Nama Rupa. And supported by attention, there is the origination of mind objects. With the cessation of attention, mind objects cease. And that actually gave a totally different understanding of what Satipatthana is and what you're supposed to be doing. You don't just notice things come and go you find out why they come, why they last, why they disappear, to prove that they really are impermanent. They don't last, nothing does. Okay, any questions about that before I go on to the next one? Yes, thank you. Yeah, over there. <laughs> so in that, uh Nama Rupa, so when the body ceases, the mind ceases as well, so which means like in a typical death, the mind ceases as well. Now you took the mind that you took, the Nama Rupa is much more than the body. That's one, one of the reasons why to call it mind objects. It's a bit of a, an approximation, but it's not that bad. To have like a mind, you need some object which it can be aware of. Something which uh, supports it. It's not an independent entity. You can't just have a mind and not be aware of something. Does it make so sense? In, so in that case, in when the five senses are not... Yeah, the five senses are gone, yeah. So once that is there, uh, not uh, you, if you are not aware of the five senses, in probably in deep meditation, so that... Yes. Just that mind... My, then mind has its own objects. But in a deep meditation, you're, you're certainly aware of things. Each of the jhanas, for example, 
it does just have its object of awareness. Oh, oh, sorry, what would be that object then? It's the different forms of bliss. It's a, a joy, a happiness, which is free, a first jhana, free from the five senses. There's a sense of being let out of jail. You're free. And that's a bliss. It's something you know, you experience. It's a, it's a Vedana from the of the mind, it's a citta sankara. And the second uh, jhana is the bliss of stillness. That's what you are aware of. If you come out afterwards, you were certainly very aware. The mind was there, but what you were aware of. So this is where, when you emerge, if you ask that question, then you can understand what particular jhana you were staying in at the time. So the jitter, the five senses have gone, but the mind is certainly there, and it has an object. You are aware of something. Is that clear? Okay. You know, the four, to me, to me, the four foundations of mindfulness, that is the heart of the Buddha's teaching. I know that's for me, okay? When I come to Buddhism, I go round, 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 and now what, you know? So it is these four foundations that gives me the understanding, you know, how, how my mind works and all these things. You know? I would actually say the... Mm. The foundation of Buddhism is Eightfold Path. Yeah, my mindfulness comes into that. Um, right oh, mindfulness. mindfulness comes in, it's part yeah. of it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I think a problem which people do have is they focus on those four foundations of mindfulness mm. and uh, kind of ignore some of the other parts of the Eightfold I know. Path. I, know. I do understand the yeah. total package, yeah, yeah. It's whole package, yeah, yeah. good. But that four foundation is a main to me, you know. Yeah. The, it's the main one, you know. Yeah. I, so I find oh, that's how my mind works. This thing, and that helped me. Yeah, it yeah. helps. Yeah. But you need the other seven factors as well. Yeah, I understand. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. What's the attention? What's that attention? That attention, when. Uh, you are not either just the object just fades away by itself or and so you're not paying attention to it or you're switching your attention to something else you're choosing to be aware of something else or a lot of times that if your attention just goes to things like you know the joys, the bliss of the jhanas you take your attention away from so many other things. You're taking your attention away from the, the five senses and the five sense objects. You go to the mind, and little by little the attention disappears as you go deeper and deeper into things. Also, that when there is kind of stillness, that when the, the object doesn't move, then it vanishes. That's also attention stops. It's just the nature of the brain and the mind that you can only notice something which is uh, changing. So if that simile which I gave many years ago, going to a Zen monastery in the north of England, just having to keep my eyes open when we were meditating, and just with your eyes wide open, just noticing the wall in front of me just totally vanish. I never closed my eyes, but the wall vanished. And it vanished because it was, as far as my brain was concerned, it was boring, nothing was happening. I didn't need to process any information from it. And so that idea of the attention disappearing, sometimes because of stability, stillness. Why does the sound of the aircon vanish? 
because of after a while you don't need to pay attention to it. Thank you. Okay, got L in the back there. Thank you, Ajahn. Um, I'm trying to understand these last few points, but have a okay. bit of difficulty. Um, so, thanks, Chamari. If the mind ceases when the objects of consciousness cease, yes. So, say if we, if we, uh, if our attention is focused in or concentrates in and then you know the peripheral things disappear and the body disappears etc and we just are aware of um, the bliss as you're saying if then that mind object ceases it says the mind ceases so what is left at that point okay the whole process of you know, the mind ceasing that is described you know by the immaterial states and it's sometimes the translations you know can be a little bit deceiving sometimes they started well the infinity of or the unbounded space or infinity of consciousness nothingness neither perception or non-perception sometimes you know the word is ananta basically undescribed, unbounded is not a bad word, simply because it means, you know, the an means without, and anta means just what describes and bounds things. So it becomes like space stops any meaning anymore. You can't, it's not part of um, your perception. And consciousness starts to vanish. That disappears as well. But you're aware of that. And you're aware of like nothing. How can you be aware of nothing? Because you think if you're aware of nothing that what you're aware the aware part of the, the mind which can know nothing will vanish. And eventually it does. And then you have this weird state of neither perception or non perception. So if you look at it from this angle, from you, you're perceiving. But what you're experiencing is non-perception. The object vanishes first. And then the thing which knows the object vanishes. And that's where you get this state of cessation of all perception and feeling for a long time until it basically the mind turns on again. This is actually where you experience the mind ceasing, the knowing, and because the objects get much more and more refined until the object almost vanishes first and then the mind stops. Thank you. Does that kind of make sense? Be honest, say no. One, one day it may. <laughs> one day it may, okay. <laughs> Thank you, Ajahn. Okay. Ajahn, if everything switches off or the whole television disappears, yeah. as you once said, um, is that something you know later? Like Correct. Looking, looking back on it? Correct, yeah. Because in each of those states of meditation, the mind is extremely powerful. And you cannot forget it. You've heard me say before, it'd be great if you could invent a word which is the same or has similar meanings to trauma, but there's no negativity to it. Trauma is usually associated with some unforgettable negative experience, which you can't forget. And there's the opposite of that uh, unforgettable positive experience, which is you know, not sort of uh, negative at all, but still has the same powerful imprint on the mind. And any time that you experience a real jhana, because the five hindrances are not active at that time, it's so easy to recall. You can't work it out at that time because the mind cannot move backwards and forwards while you're actually experiencing that jhana. 
but it leaves a very strong imprint on the mind. So when you come out afterwards, that's when you can kind of analyze it. You can know what was there, what was not there. And that's the time when you can uh, work out the the data which you've just experienced. Five hindrances are usually still gone and work out what it really means. And as if you go even deeper, you find more and more things vanishing. It's like the art of disappearance. All the objects start to vanish and then so does that type of consciousness. The mind consciousness starts to get much, much more refined. And as it gets more refined, there's many of the concepts which it uses to define the world and consciousness itself start to vanish. And that's actually where you can start to see because the objects disappear. The, that particular aspect of the mind vanishes too. And this is actually what happens. But you can only remember that after you come out. While you're inside of there, you're perfectly aware, but you can't do anything. You don't have to exercise memory. You can remember those things, you can't forget them. Okay, hope it makes sense. Okay, Eddie's got his hand up first, yeah. Bottom and I jump up. You said the object vanishes first, okay? Yeah. So uh, you are probably right, okay? But don't you think you have to also bear in mind that mind too, the, you, the, your mind is holding to the object, you know, okay? And then if, if it's mind, it, it's, if object vanishes, it's, it goes hand in hand, I would say, you know, this mind and object and involves our feeling too, you know, okay? Yeah, but this so is don't you think it's a, when the feeling vanishes yeah, no, this and is then the whole thing is gone? Uh, these are this, so talking about the arupas, it's a very deep, mm. deep meditations you know, which come after the fourth jhana. This is far more refined. Mm. So, so anyway, uh, you had, Lee had a, a question. So Ajahn, when you um, enter a deep state of meditation and your mind ceases, Okay. Is that like entering <coughs> an immaterial realm? If your mind actually ceases, it's deeper than the immaterial realms. This is a cessation of perception and consciousness. At that point, there's nothing there. So when you remember, recall those experiences, you come out, you recall you know, great periods of time vanishing, but then what was before and what was after was those fourth um, immaterial attainment. That's how you know it wasn't just unconsciousness, it was cessation. And you, know, you, you can only go to those states by going through the jhanas and the fourth jhana in particular. Perfect, fourth jhana is the perfect mindfulness very still, very mild. If you stay there long enough, it will happen automatically. Nothing is moving and things will vanish. That simile of the thousand petal lotus was a very beautiful, wonderful simile. It brings it down to earth, sort of. This is what happens, that lotus is out under the sun of mindfulness and kindness. And it's not something you do, it's something which has been established and it opens up by itself. You can't make any decision, I'm in fourth jhana now, now I'll go into the immaterials. It's in any thought like that is impossible. Fight way too still. I don't know why we're going into this because we're supposed to be talking about mindfulness of the body. But nevertheless, I'm very happy to talk about this. I was just wondering what would bring you back then? That's an excellent question. And the only thing is because of just like karma. You don't bring it back. You can't say I'm going to come back. It's just the karma, the body is still viable. 
You don't have to be. No, you don't. Oh, my goodness, no. These are amazing states. Anybody who's got anything close to that, not any fear at all, you just be dancing down the street. <laughs> Whether you can dance or not. It just it gives you a taste of you know, just what this meditation can do. And just how incredible this is, you know, accessing the mind. And allowing the mind to cease. It's really cool. Any other comments or questions? Um, I just I will carry on with this because it's four twenty and I know that I'm not gonna be teaching again to um what's it called? You okay? Not till um January. So we're just going to just go through very quickly because it is very quick. Mindfulness of experience and the mindfulness of jitter. How are you mindful of experience? This is back on the Satipatthana. Instead of calling Vedana feeling, which has all sorts of other meanings, I prefer to call it experience. There's three main types of experience with each one of the senses, the pleasant, the unpleasant and in between. When feeling a pleasant experience, you are mindful that you feel a pleasant experience. An unpleasant experience, you're mindful that you feel an unpleasant experience. When feeling a neutral experience, you are mindful that you're feeling a neutral experience. So you understand that these experiences, Vedana, you see that happening, that now it's pleasant, now it's unpleasant, now it's in between. But now they have other types of feelings when feeling a worldly pleasant experience, a worldly unpleasant experience, or a worldly neutral experience, you're mindful that you feel such a worldly unpleasant experience. When feeling an unworldly pleasant experience, an unworldly unpleasant experience, or an unworldly neutral experience, you're mindful that you feel such an unworldly pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral experience. In this way, you're aware of your own experience, or you're aware that the experience of others is of the same nature as yours, you're aware, you abide mindful of both your own and others' experience, or else you abide aware of what causes the arising of experience. And that's in a sensory contact. You abide that experiences of the nature to cease when sensory contact ceases. You abide contemplating experiences' causal nature of both arising and ceasing, or mindfulness that is just experience. Impermanent suffering, not me, not mine, not a permanent essence, is established in you to the extent necessary for mindfulness and wisdom essential for liberation. And you abide independent, not clinging to anything in the world. That is how a meditator abides mindful of experience. So, first of all, you realize that these experiences, the Vedana which you, you experience, is out of control. You experience a pleasant, unpleasant, or in-between experience. And as some other person once says, that pleasant experience is just the space between two unpleasant experiences. And two unple an unpleasant experience is the space between two pleasant experiences. Pleasant is the space between two unpleasant. Did I get the, the right way around? Anyway, you can understand you can't have one without the other. So even you know, in extreme places like Auschwitz, people would tell jokes and laugh. When I first read that, you know, from people who were there and survived, they thought, that's incredible. But they can always have happiness in all sorts of different areas of life. And you always see that. So what is, you can't have unremitting, unpleasant experience. It can last for a long time. But you also you have the different types of experience, the worldly and unworldly. And the worldly pleasant experience is what many of you know, but the unworldly stuff is the inspirational stuff. Number one, when like just, I just 
last night, I went off to a Vietnamese, Vietnamese Hearts, they called it, group, raising money for the Perth Children's Hospital. And at the last I heard, they raised 450,000. Just in a group of ordinary people having a dinner and just charity and just making donations. It's incredible just what they did. To me, that inspires me. That is not worldly. That's unworldly pleasant experience. So you have to make the difference between the two of them. And as far as the path is concerned, the unworldly pleasant experience is not to be feared. Feared. You can indulge in that. Of course, the other unworldly pleasant experience is, as you know, the jhanas and the great insights. It's a pleasant path. Okay, I thought... Okay. Now, mindfulness of the jitter, of the mind. Many people feel they can practice this, but what does it actually mean? How are you mindful of the jitter? Straight away it says you understand a mind that is affected by wanting as such, and a mind that is unaffected by wanting as such. Please change the language here. Not to being aware of a mind affected by wanting, because if you have wanting, you're not really that mindful. The mindfulness is lessened by the power of wanting. But you understand. You understand a mind that is affected by aversion as such, a mind that is unaffected by aversion as such. You understand a mind that is affected by delusion as such, and the mind that is unaffected by delusion as such. You understand the contracted mind is contracted because of dullness and drowsiness, the third hindrance, and distracted mind is distracted because of restlessness and remorse. These are minds with uh, either the, the three defilements or the five hindrances. They don't say doubt, because how can you understand a mind with doubt? The doubt stops you. You understand an exalted mind, a surpassed mind, a still mind, and a liberated mind. And they all if, say, refer to a mind in jhana as such. And an unexalted, unsurpassed, not still, and not liberated mind, those are minds not in jhana as such. In other words, if you're going to be practicing the third satipatthana, you have to have the experience of jhanas. Otherwise, you can't complete this. It actually says that. You understand the exalted mind as such, and an unexalted mind as such, a mind in jhana, a mind not in jhana. In this way, you're aware of your own mind, you're aware that others' minds, jitters, are the same as yours, or you abide aware of both your own and others' jitters. Or else you abide aware of what causes the arising of the jitter. It's Nama Rupa. Or you abide aware the jitter is of the nature to cease, when Namarupa cease. Or you abide contemplating the jitter's causal nature of both arising and ceasing. Or else mindfulness, it is just jitter, impermanent, suffering, and not me, mine, not a permanent essence, is established in you to the extent necessary for mindfulness and wisdom necessary or essential to liberation and you abide independent not clinging to anything in the world this is how you are mindful of the mind and I kind of like that one as Eddie said you know this Satipatthana really important but you can't really do the third Satipatthana if you haven't had any experience of jhanas. You haven't got the data to focus on and to contemplate. Please, if you disagree with some of the translations, please have a look it up for yourself. These are pretty accurate translations. Okay. 
I do, and one more question from the here. Are new minds arising all the time? Can a new mind only form in karma loka or other spheres of existence as well? With metta. I don't know why that question is answered because the Buddha actually does say yes. It's only in two suttas that you have um, some things are developing consciousness, even in things like plants. But they haven't fully developed their five candles yet, but it's a possibility to do so. Oh my goodness, I've got more questions, keep coming up. Please, no more questions, got to go in a moment. Does a modern life and its practices of hair color, makeup, and the focus of trying to stay and look young go against the practice of mindfulness? Yeah, okay. That's why, uh, see if you can find a photo of Je Sarah Jessica Parker. Maybe it's because she read my book that she doesn't wear makeup anymore. <laughs> but any anyway, that why don't you accept aging as a process? As civilization advances in collapse, how does one remain still amongst the storm? Just <laughs> try and f learn how to live simply, learn how to live kindly, and civilization advances in collapse. And a lot of time people were saying that, and sometimes I've been old enough now, I've seen many times people thinking that doomsday is coming next week, and it never did. So who knows? I certainly I know that, um, actually it's true, I won't be here next week. But I will be here before the end of the year on Ajahn Brahm's New Year's Eve party. So I'm sure it won't collapse yet. You've got a few days to go. So thank you all for listening. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Okay, now I'm going to bow three times and then we see what happens next. <laughs>